very, very lovely evening to all of you, my dear friends. I'm ever so thankful that you all could join me once again, as always. Um, we left off in our part 21 study on the life of Christ, where the Mount of Transfiguration has just occurred, and we see Christ and the three disciples now descending from the mountain. And it came to pass that on the next day, when they were come down from the hill, much people met him, Jesus. And behold, a man of the company cried out, saying, Master, I beseech thee, look upon my son, for he is mine only child. And lo, a spirit taketh him, and he suddenly crieth out, and it teareth him, that he foameth again at the mouth, foaming at the mouth, and bruising him hardly, departeth from him. Gil noted, The demon is very loath to leave him. Even after he was, he has distressed, convulsed, and bruised him in this disdainful manner, such was his cruelty and malice. This is a particularly evil demon. If you'll recall the two demoniacs before this occasion, these demons are very apt to just tear these bodies all to pieces. It's, a, it's almost like they thrive on evil. They thrive on hatred. And I believe that that's what happens whenever one is given over and completely separated from God because God is the fountain of love. God is love. So not being around him, then there's only hate. And it should also be noted that this child that this man is speaking of, it's probably 99% chance my theory on this, according to the Bible's description of a child He's probably in his late teens or early 20s. Don't picture this as a seven or eight year old boy. We'll come to that right here in a second. He's probably much older. Jesus answereth this man and saith, O faithless generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I suffer you? Bring him unto me. Helicott wrote, How long shall I suffer you? The words are significant as suggesting the thought that our Lord's whole life was one long tolerance of the waywardness and perversity of men. McLaren noted, They had shown that they were not fit to be trusted alone, the people. He had been away for a day up in the mountain there, and though they did not build an altar to any golden calf like they did in the days of Moses, like their ancestors when their leader, Moses, was absent, still, when he comes back, he finds things all gone wrong because of the few hours of his absence. What would they do if he were to go away from them altogether? No wonder they're called lost sheep. They they immediately just lose faith, and Jesus is pointing this out very clearly. And they brought the boy unto Jesus, and when the boy saw him, straightway the spirit tear him, and he fell on the ground and wallowed foaming. The demon threw him into a violent fit, Gil wrote, shook him and convulsed him in a dreadful manner, knowing his time was short, just like Satan in these last days, and being filled with indignation and rage that he should be obliged, as he knew he must, to leave the child very speedily, and was therefore resolved to do all the mischief and put him to all the pain he possibly could. The, and notice how Jesus creates and Satan destroys. You know, God, he, he creates, he nourishes, he makes, he blesses people, and all Satan does is seeks to kill, steal, and destroy. That is all he wants to do. That is a true hatred for God, in my honest opinion. He just wants to destroy everything that God has made. He knows that there's no hope, and that is the actions of one in whom has no hope. They just want to wreck everything. They already know they're damned forever. And if you also notice how it mentions in this very verse how they brought this boy to him. The father didn't carry him in his arms like you would a six or seven year old. No, it's believed that this was a young man. And Jesus asked his father, how long is it ago since this came unto him? And his father said, of a child. And oft times it hath cast him into the fire and into the waters to destroy him. But if thou canst do anything, meaning if you can do anything, have compassion on us and help us. Notice it says, have compassion on us and help us. Jameson Fawcett Brown, 
Help us, says the father, for it was a sore family affliction. Compare the language of the Syrophoenician woman regarding her daughter. Lord, help me. You know, her daughter was the one possessed, but she was saying, you know, it's it's not just that Satan wants to destroy an individual. This this completely disrupts the entire family unit. Everyone lives in a state of darkness whenever this kind of evil comes upon an individual. But I do believe that Benson kind of lays out the father's mode of thinking right here. The afflicted father, greatly discouraged by the inability of our Lord's disciples and dispirited by the sight of his son's misery and by the remembrance of its long continuance, was afraid this possession might surpass the power of Jesus himself. It's to the point of no hope. And Jesus sees this very lack of faith. Jesus said unto him, If thou can believe, all things are possible to him that believeth. And straightway the father of the child cried out and said with tears, He yells this. This is a sore vexation. Lord, I believe. Help thou mine unbelief. He knows that the Lord sees that he doesn't really believe as much as maybe just a little. David Guzik noted, In this case, the man's unbelief was not a rebellion against or a rejection of God's promise. He did not deny God's promise. He desired it. However, it just seemed too good to be true. And this is the case with so many of us. Thus he said, Help my unbelief. He knows that it's lacking, and he wants to do something about it. This isn't him rejecting the thought that maybe Christ would... He's, he just knows that... There's a war within himself, like all of us. When Jesus saw that the people came running together, he rebuked the foul spirit, saying unto him, Thou dumb and deaf spirit, I charge thee, come out of him, and enter no more into him. Catch that. He says, Enter no more into him. This is said with regard to the devil, who would be desirous of repossession. Christ even speaks of this in another time. And also with respect to the father of the child to confirm his faith in the cure and that he might be in no pain about the return of the disorder. It's one thing to cure someone. It's another thing to let others see you cure him and to say this will not happen anymore. That anxiety of it reoccurring could still rest upon you every day for the next year or two. You're probably going to wake up and think, Oh no, it, this could be, if he has any outbursts, you think it's coming back. So this is a great, um, bit of mercy and grace on Jesus's part. And the spirit, the demon cried and rent him sore and came out of him. And he was as one dead in so much that many said he is dead. The malignant, cruel spirit, now conscious that his time was come, gathers up his whole strength with intent by a last stroke to kill his victim. No doubt he was trying to kill the, the poor boy and had nearly succeeded, but the Lord of life was there. But Jesus took him by the hand and lifted him up, and he arose. Then came the disciples to Jesus apart, meaning up away from the crowd, and said, Why could not we cast him out? And Jesus said unto them, Because of your unbelief, for verily I say unto you, If ye have faith as a grain of mustard seed, ye shall say unto this mountain, here's the famous verse, ye shall say unto this mountain, Remove hence to yonder place, and it shall remove, and nothing shall be impossible unto you. Now for any of you in whom have tried doing this, and seen that it did not succeed, I believe that Bingo gives the one of the best explanations for it. From this, it is clear that the transportation of a mountain is a less miracle than the ejection of a devil of the kind mentioned in the text. For the devil clings more closely to a man spiritually than the mountain to its roots physically. And faith, even the smallest, is more powerful than the fixture of a mountain. Now that shows us a great deal about how much that a demon desires to possess a person. And I believe that a lot of it has to do with rest. Jesus says that whenever they're cast out of a man, they go into dry places, meaning, you know, places with no people. It's almost like the Lord himself puts them where there is no one, uh, Oftentimes, this is cemeteries or woods or deserts or someplace like that. But they go into these dry places and they seek rest and they find it not. So I believe that the only time that they actually get to rest is whenever they're embodying people. And uh, what kind of rest is for the wicked anyway? You will say, why then is that miracle less frequent than the other? 
Answer, a mountain is naturally by creation in its proper place. This is why you're not going to see a mountain be uprooted. Jesus is trying to make a far deeper point, as he always does. And a mountain is naturally by creation in its proper place. A devil is not so when possessing a man. Wherefore, it is more beneficial that the latter, the demon, should be cast out than that a mountain should be removed. The Lord set the mountain there, and if he found any reason for his will and you to cast it into the sea, then it would be appropriate to do, but otherwise it's in its place for a reason. Howbeit this kind, this demon, goeth not out but by prayer and fasting. The words were, we may believe, Ellicott noted, dramatized by a gesture pointing to the mountain from which our Lord and the three disciples had just descended from the Mount of Transfiguration, as afterwards by a like act in reference to the Mount of Olives. And notice also how the Lord mentions prayer and fasting. Well, did not the disciples pray and fast? The disciples, we know, did not as yet fast. Jesus himself makes reference to this in Matthew 9. And the facts implied that they had been weak and remiss in prayer. Every time that Jesus asked them to go pray somewhere, they fall asleep, and he stays up and prays all night. The words are noticeable as testifying to the real ground and motive for fasting and to the gain for the higher life to be obtained when it was accompanied by true prayer. By this act of conquest over the lower nature, the words point to, according to pulpit, the words point to a truth in the spiritual world that there are different degrees in the satanic hierarchy. Some demons are more malignant than others and have greater power over the souls of men. In the present case, the possession was of long standing. It revolved a terrible bodily malady. It was of an intense and unusual character. This, this boy whom we can assume was, you know, 18, 19, 20. He had for years had this upon him, and this demon had made its rest, resting place within him. His body was the demon's home. So no wonder it threw such a fit whenever Jesus cast it out. The exorcist needed special preparation. He must inspire and augment his faith by prayer and self-discipline. Prayer invokes the aid of God and puts oneself unreservedly in his hands. Fasting subdues the flesh, arouses the soul's energies, brings into exercise the higher parts of man's nature. We see subduing the flesh in fasting and uplifting God in prayer. So it's the best of both worlds. Thus equipped, a man is open to receive power from on high and can quell the assaults of the evil one. And they departed thence and passed through Galilee, and he would not that any man should know it. For he taught his disciples and said unto them, The Son of Man is delivered into the hands of men, and they shall kill him. And after that he is killed, he shall rise the third day. But they understood not this saying, and it was hid from them. It was hid from them, that they perceived it not, and they feared to ask him of that saying. Imagining that he had a secret mystical meaning in it, which they could not reach, because remember, as we've already went over, they they couldn't conceive of the promised Messiah having to die and then be buried and then resurrecting on the third day. They, they thought all of this was figurative, which they could not reach, lest he should reproach them with their dullness and stupidity or should rebuke them with the like sharpness and severity he had reproved Peter not long ago upon the same head. And when they were come to Capernaum, they that received tribute money came to Peter and said, Doth not your master pay tribute? Once again, Capernaum, this is where Peter resided, and where Christ stayed with Simon Peter for basically the whole majority of his ministry, especially after Nazareth um, rejected him. But what this is doing is this is a tribute collector. He's a Jew coming up to Simon Peter's house in Capernaum, and he's asking about paying tribute. What does he mean? This is not to be mistaken with the Roman taxes. 
This was a Jewish tribute. This tribute was collected even from the Jews in foreign countries, was paid into the Corban or the treasury of the temple, and was used to defray the expenses of its services. After the destruction of Jerusalem, Vespasian ordered that it should still be collected as before, and as if adding insult to injury, be paid to the fund for rebuilding the temple of the Capitoline Jupiter, a false god. Their question implies that they half thought that the prophet Christ of Nazareth had evaded or would disclaim payment. They were looking out for another transgression of the law. This is what they're trying to do. They're trying to catch him in any way that they can. And as soon as he entered Capernaum, they tracked him, probably to Peter's house, and put the question to his disciple. So this tribute was to go for services within the temple. Okay? And Peter replies to this tribute collector, he saith, Yes, my master does pay tribute. And when he was coming to the house, Jesus prevented him, saying, What thinkest thou, Simon? Of whom do the kings of the earth take custom or tribute? Of their own children or of strangers? Peter saith unto him, Of strangers. They don't go to their children, you know, to collect tribute. The children are part of the house, of them, the palace, whatever you will. So they go out to everyone else. Jesus saith unto him, Then are the children free. Albert Barnes noted, The meaning of this may be thus expressed. Basically what Jesus is saying is, Kings do not tax their own sons. This tribute money is taken up for the temple service, that is, the service of my father. I, therefore, being the son of God, for whom this is taken up, cannot be lawfully required to pay this tribute. Notwithstanding, lest we should offend them, go thou to the sea, and cast a hook, and take up the fish that first cometh up. And when thou hast opened his mouth, thou shalt find a piece of money, that take, and give unto them for me and thee. Now this is one of those more known miracles of Christ. Go out and catch this fish, there'll be a coin in its mouth, give it to this tribute. It is proof that Jesus, according to Barnes, it was proof that Jesus was possessed of divine attributes. If he knew that the first fish that came up would have such a coin in his mouth, it was proof of omniscience. He knows all things, including that a fish with a coin in its mouth. It is by no means absurd that a fish should have swallowed a silver coin. Many of them bite eagerly at anything bright and would not hesitate, therefore, at swallowing a piece of money. If you've ever went fishing, you know. If you got a little shiny thing, a little bait that's shiny, they'll gobble it right up. At the same time came the disciples unto Jesus, saying, Who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? And he took a child and set him in the midst of them. And when he had taken him in his arms, he picks him up like this, he said unto them, Verily I say unto you, Except you be converted and become as little children, you shall not enter into the kingdom of heaven. Whosoever therefore shall humble himself as this little child, the same is greatest in the kingdom of heaven. This has long been pondered upon what Jesus means by this, but I do believe that expositors had it had uh, written it best. It was indeed Phariseeism in the bud he had to deal with. He's trying to make that he always raged against Pharisees, but he loved these little children. Now why? Like children in unpretentiousness there was no fakery with children they just say whatever they think and do whatever they do you know a king's child has no more thought of greatness than a beggar's he says the greatest will be the one not desiring to be great if you'll notice a child in christ's arms how the child is completely reliant upon christ He's not trying to stand there and act like he can stand on his own two feet like the Pharisees. They're not, it's a very deep meaning. It's, they're not about their own righteousness. They're about everything to do with God. God is Father. We are children. We know our place. There is no gray area, just like little children. Whosoever shall receive one of such children in my name receiveth me. And whosoever shall receive me receiveth not me, but him that sent me. Another very obvious note on the Trinity, mind you. Jesus says, the one whom sent me, you really accept God. And it's almost like Jesus hesitates to tell them because he, it's already too, they already can't accept little truths. Now God in the flesh with them is just, it's mind blowing for them to think. 
Whoever shows respect, John Gill notes, whoever shows respect and performs the least office of love and kindness to the least believer, that's what he's meaning by child, comparable to a little child, in my name is one of his, bears his image, partakes of his grace, is loved by him, and shall be glorified with him. Such is Christ's great regard to his humble followers, that he takes it all as one as if done to himself. He says, even the person with the least amount of faith in the kingdom of God, he says, you are treating them just like you would me, as we're all children of God through him. That's very, very lovely. He takes it personal if it happens to you. Never, ever think if you're a Christian that you're alone. You are very much not. You're the exact opposite of alone, actually. And John answered and said, Master, we saw one casting out devils in thy name, and we forbade him, because he followeth not with us. And Jesus said unto him, Forbid him not, for he that is not against us is for us. Just like after we die, there is no purgatory there's no gray place there's no place in between we are in the place in between heaven and hell after we die whoever you go to one or the other and that is it so he says whoever is for us is not against us and it is with that my friends that we will stop right there we'll pick up in this very same narrative going into lord willing the next session god of peace be with you all amen